Hatten Sie schon mal ein 19-Euro-Déjà-vu? Bitteschön. Der günstigste Sparpreis aller Zeiten ist wieder da. Reisen Sie jetzt wieder für nur 19 Euro mit der Bahn durch ganz Deutschland. Inklusive Reisefieber. Jetzt buchen. Diese Zeit gehört dir. The Helicaster Jane Show airs Wednesdays 3 p.m. Eastern. The podcast always available online at helicasterjane.com. Dot com. You know, you've won more than your fair share of awards, lady. I mean, oh my God, you've racked up just about every one that there is to get. There are critics, though. There are always critics. I mean, what would this world sure. be without critics? And they come at you, uh, queen of the airport novel. What do you say to those idiots out there who say queen of the airport well, novel? I mean, you know what it is. This is very competitive and, you know, people like to throw stones at anybody that's that's out there and has had a successful, you know, whether it's a series of novels or television shows or movies or whatever it is. And so I, I tried to ignore it, but yeah, it's no fun to hear things like that. Oh, those critics, queen of the airport novel indeed. 29 New York Times bestsellers, over 100 million books sold, And 25 years later, Miss Patricia Cornwell defies all criticism. Now out with another Scarpetta novel, soon to be a bestseller, I'm sure. Depraved Heart. Miss Cornwell will join me at my table in just a moment, along with one of my favorite guests on the Hallie Kasser Jane Show, retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant and author Colonel Dan Hampton, who is here to talk about his latest fabulous book, The Hunter Killers. But first, hi, and welcome to the Hallie Kasser Jane Show. I am Hallie Kasser Jane. Today, the Hallie Kasser Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Get a free audiobook and 30 day trial today by signing up at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Hallie Kasser Jane Show. And remember, The Hallie Kasser Jane Show is always available online at HallieCasserJane.com and a host of venues including Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, TuneIn Radio, iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, and on the iHeart Radio Network. It's been 25 years, that's right, I said 25 years since best-selling author Patricia Cornwell launched the hugely popular Dr. K. Scarpetta series and a national obsession with forensic research. Yep, before there was CSI, NCIS, and all the other copycats, there was Cornwell and Scarpetta. 25 years since her first book, Postmortem, was rejected by numerous publishers because no one wanted to read about a woman who cuts people open. But how wrong were they? The morgue is taboo no more. And now, yep, 25 years later, 29 New York Times bestsellers under her belt, Patricia Cornwell is back with a new captivating Scarpetta thriller, Depraved Heart, with all the shocking twists, high wire tension, and cutting edge forensic details that Cornwell is famous for, proving yet again why she's the world's number one bestselling crime writer. Let's talk. So listen, 25 years, you and Dr. K. Scarpetta together for all those years. A lot of water under that bridge, too, for the two of you. So tell me this. How is living with Kay? How has it changed your life? Oh, living with Kay has completely changed my life. And, you know, this is a very interesting thing that when I started out as a writer, if you had told me that when you create characters, they also create you, I would have thought that was a very silly thing to say. But it turns out to be true, because if you develop series characters, um, and Scarpetta most, most of all, cause, and she's actually, you know, we're celebrating her 25th birthday, but the fact is even several years before the first book came out, you know, I was playing around with the notion of this character and trying to put her in stories and trying to figure out how to do all this. So she's been around for a while, but when you are constantly focused on certain characters, you have to do things to learn about them. And in the process of doing those things, it changes you. So 
to give you some very graphic examples, when you see thousands of autopsies and, and become a volunteer police officer and put on a uniform and go to crime scenes and do all these things that I began to do in the early days when you learn to fly helicopters and get your pilot's license or ride motorcycles or become a scuba diver, all so you can show these characters doing these things, of course that changes you. And I can honestly say that I think spending a quarter of a century with my imaginary friends particularly Scarpetta, have, I think, made me a better person. I'm really grateful for it. It's fascinating, isn't it? Listen, listen to me. This is the figure that I just found. I don't know if this is the latest, but this is what I found. A hundred million books. You have yes, sold? Yes, that's what it was as of several years ago. I don't know what it is now, but it's at least a hundred million books. And that from somebody who, when my first one finally got accepted post-mortem, and that was 1989, it came out in 1990, um, at, at that time, the first printing of postmortem was 6,000 copies, and um, I got paid $6,000, and there was no budget for doing anything. So you, you would have, if you had told me then that this would happen, I'm really glad I didn't know it. I think it would have scared me to death. Can you take, I would have run for the hills. <laughs> I know I would have. <laughs> Can you take that in, though? Can that figure even get into your body? I mean, that's wild to me. No, I, you know, you, here's why I can't even begin to wrap my mind around that. You know, I've been to warehouses where, you know, you have to do massive stock signings. So I know what it looks like to see thousands of books stacked up. I can't um, begin to imagine a hundred million. I mean, I'm sure you could almost go around the planet with that. I don't know what you do with it, but it's, it's, um, and the fun thing is for all, all those books you've sold, you don't know how many other people have actually read exactly. those same books. And so you it's really quite an honor to think that so many people may have read even one Scarpetta story. It's really, um, I've been incredibly fortunate. Really. And that's after having a really tough childhood, a father who abandoned you when you were, what, five, and a mom who suffered from depression. Yeah. You wound up in foster care. I understand foster care. I raised a foster care child. It's going well, up. Well, I bet a trip. you raised yours better than that foster I, person raised me. So I understand. So I understand. But I, right? I get that. I think one of the things that's really um, remarkable when you talk about someone's childhood, particularly an artist, I think if you have the hardships, you don't wish for them, and you would never wish for them for anybody else, and you wouldn't do it to somebody, but what it does do is if you're really uncomfortable as a little kid, you try to find ways to soothe yourself, and I did it through my imagination. My The world was not a very happy place for me, so I created things that were better than what I was living in. And I became really good at a very young age of creating imaginary friends and imaginary situations. And I literally would go out on my bicycle and on, I was on missions. I was a spy. I was um, like a little Nancy Drew. You know, if there was a problem in the neighborhood in my imagination, I was going to go take care of it. And I'd go riding around and telling myself stories and writing stories and creating little books. And so what a gift so yes, it wasn't fun, um, and I was lonely, and I was very sad a lot as a little kid, but what a gift I was given to learn how to do this. Exactly, and here's the thing that I want to ask you about that, though. You know, so many other kids who might have gone through that, and I know even after you had tough times as a result, but you got yourself together and look what you've built, and I want to know why you think you were able to not take to the bed like another bunch of kids might have done and go out there and, and make it. Tell me why. Do you know? Well, I think the most important reason why <clears throat> is that I had other people, and it only takes one. Don't ever forget, because now you were talking a minute ago about uh, being a foster parent, and that's a really good example that you take one person who intercedes with, shall we say, someone who's been abandoned or has suffered tremendous loss and is not being taken care of. That one person can change a life and change the world. And I had somebody like that. I was very fortunate because when I turned 19, and um, I was I dropped out of school. I had an eating disorder. I was a mess and a very very sad, unhappy person and and scared person. And this I had the most amazing miracle happen. I mean, uh, Ruth Graham, who was Billy Graham's wife, has nothing to do with religion. Forget the religion part of it. But she was this major, beautiful celebrity woman in our town. And everybody even wanted to have a minute with this woman, much less be her friend. And I'd always, and I'd admired her from afar, you know, my whole childhood. 
and she swooped in and became my my mentor. Lucky she you. Just, I, and that changed my life because what it did for me is I thought I m- must be something worthwhile about me that a woman as important as Ruth Graham would would care about me. Why would she? I'm just a little neighborhood riffraff, you know. Uh. So. That that really is what made the difference. And, you know, there's a little bit of Ruth and Scarpetta um, that would, would shock people. You'd never think of that with someone married to Billy Graham. But this was a feisty, beautiful woman who was absolutely afraid of nothing. And if there was something going on, she would she would step right in and change the day. And, and of course, my first book was a biography of her. Let's get so, to books. Let's get so to that, books. <laughs> Let's get to books. They're gonna kill, I want to get to books. They're going to kill me if I don't get it to a depraved heart. we got to get know, to books. I love but, this um, book. But you want to finish what you were saying? Go. Tell me. No, I'm only saying that when you talk about... I couldn't have written Depraved Heart had I not grown up the way I did. I mean, all of this has made me who I am. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I love this title, by the way, Depraved Heart. So, (laughs) great word, Depraved. Talk to me. Where did this story come from and why now? Well, Depraved Heart, as you probably know, is is a legal term. And what it refers to is an absolute wanton disregard of, of human life. And so, it's referring to the worst of the worst in terms of a predator who not only has no respect for human life, but loves to toy with it and cause tremendous upset and suffering, just mayhem. And so this book opens, the new Scarpetta book opens with our character, our hero, Scarpetta, is at a crime scene. It's an 18th century mansion on the border of the Harvard campus, and there's a dead woman on the floor, blood everywhere, supposedly an accident. And she's looking at it thinking, um, this is no accident. And just as this is going on, something lands on her phone, an alert tone, and a surveillance video has been sent to her that has to do with her her beloved niece, Lucy, who's also quite a handful, as, as any of the fans of the series knows. So this is the beginning of an unbelievable adventure where Scarpetta is literally almost having her puppet strings pulled by an, ex- an external force. And it's going to be a, it's a really spooky, scary book, a real psychological thr- thriller um, that sets it slightly apart from some of my earlier Scarpetta books. You have all the, for, the technology, the forensic science, forensic medicine um, in this book, just like you always do. But it's also really it's meant to be a good Halloween scare. Do you have fun with this one? How does this one uh, rack on, on all your books? I did have fun with this one for a very decided reason. I decided to create a scene, which is this spooky, spooky old house, and to make us live in it the entire book, because there's so much that has to do with this house, it becomes a character. And you're supposed to start saying about page 10, Scarpetta, for God's sake, get out of there now while the getting's good. Love it. You know, you've won more than your share, fair share of awards, lady. I mean, oh, my God, you've racked up just about every one that there is to get. There are critics, though. There are always critics. I mean, what would this world sure. be without critics? And they come at you, and queen of the airport novel. I got to tell you what, I happen to think you're a damn good writer. You know, the two things to write storytelling, there's storytelling and there's writing. And I think you do both damn well. There's a reason why all Thank these people are, are reading you. What do you say to those idiots out there who say queen of the airport well, novel? I've, I've, yeah, no, I've had a lot. I mean, you know what it is. It's just very competitive. And, you know, people like to throw stones at anybody that's, that's out there and has had a successful, you know, whether it's a series of novels or television shows or movies or whatever it is. And so I, I tried to ignore it, but yeah, it's no fun to hear things like that. And no, my, uh, to call my books airport novels is absolutely ridiculous. Absurd. Um, I don't sit around and write romances, you know, I mean, I would say to the people that say that, then why don't you go spend a day in the morgue, you go to crime scenes, you fly helicopters, you scuba dive the Bermuda Triangle, and then come back to me and tell me that I'm doing something trivial. I've been speaking with best-selling author, the queen of crime, Patricia Cornwell. 25 years writing the Scarpetta series, out with her latest, Depraved Heart, by way of William Morrow. For more information about Patricia Cornwell, visit her website at patriciacornwell.com, on Twitter at 1P Cornwell, and on Facebook at Patricia Cornwell. Retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Dan Hampton flew 151 combat missions during his 20 years in the United States Air Force. For his service in the Iraq War, Kosovo conflict, and First Gulf War, 
Colonel Hampton received four distinguished flying crosses with valor, a Purple Heart, eight Air Medals with valor, five Meritorious Service Medals, and numerous other citations. He is a graduate of the elite United States Air Force Fighter Weapons School, United States Navy Top Gun School, and United States Air Force Special Operations School. Hampton was named his squadron's instructor pilot of the year six times and pioneered air combat tactics that are now standard. A frequent guest analyst on CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC discussing foreign affairs, military aviation, and intelligence issues, the graduate of Texas A&M University has published numerous articles. He has published in Aviation History, the Journal of Electronic Defense, Air Force Magazine, Vietnam Magazine, and Air Power Magazine, and written several classified tactical works. He is the author of the national bestsellers, Viper Pilot, and Lords of the Sky. In his latest book, The Hunter Killers, he recounts the extraordinary story of the first wild weasels, the band of maverick aviators who flew the most dangerous missions of the Vietnam War. Let's talk. So, Dan... Dan, darling, it's always so nice to have you here on the show with me, especially when you return with a book and a story as compelling as told in this really terrific, I have to tell you, I love this book, The Hunter Killers. I do, I do. So this is really some story. And and let me just say that the way you wrote it is also something else. This is a little bit of a departure for you. This reads like a novel. Well, I was was fortunate in that, obviously, I've been a pilot too, so... I, you know, I know what it's like to fly a jet and get shot at, uh, but I'd never flown these airplanes. But I was fortunate also in that these guys that actually did fly it, uh, these missions, a lot of them are still here. And I was able to talk to them, and they were able to, you know, help me with the chapters and read it and, pre, you know, brief it and everything else. So You're being modest. Was, this is your Brit, no, baby. Well, you did a beautiful job and, and own it. So let me, before we even go into all that, I, this, I want to just set it up because for people who don't know this story that we're getting into, it's Vietnam. It's 1965, July 24th. The U.S. Air Force F-4 Phantom Jet is suddenly blown from the sky by a mysterious and lethal weapon, a Soviet SA-2 surface-to-air missile, otherwise known as SAM, launched by Russian, in quotes, advisors to North Vietnam. And three days later, right, six uh, what, F-105 Thunder Chiefs were brought down trying to avenge the Phantom. And it only got worse after that, right? Well, yeah, and, and that shoot-down, that F-4 shoot-down was 50 years ago today. Wow. Yep. Such timing. And, and the, uh, the, the Spring High raid that you're talking about was three days later. Uh, and that's a pretty critical three days. The politicians in Washington couldn't make up their minds what to do. And then when they did decide to let these guys go in and wipe out the SAM sites, Lyndon Johnson publicized it. He went on TV to give everybody warning that they were coming because he was afraid we'd kill some Soviet advisors. Uh, so these guys were basically ambushed. And yeah, they lost six, six out of 46 F-105s. Not, not good. Not good at all. Not good at all. Another part to it was that they actually knew these things were being built and kept quiet about it for a long time, right? Yeah, I mean, it was obvious in, in all through the beginning part of 1965 that these things were there. And and Johnson and McNamara wouldn't let the military go take them out. They were more worried about losing, about killing Soviet military advisors than they were about losing our own guys, which is just appalling. It's it's almost criminal behavior. Absolutely, no questions. Yeah. So now they're Johnny Come Latelys, and they decide that they're going to set up this top secret program called Wild Weasel, right? Uh, yeah. What happened is after the Spring High Raid. The Pentagon basically put its foot down and said something has to be done. And Johnson and McNamara were pretty appalled by by the by, by the results of that raid. So they gave permission for everything to go ahead. And so within six months, which is very very quick for the military, uh, a bunch of equipment had been pulled out of bomber aircraft, uh, self protection equipment, and some other things detection equipment, because uh, they were the only ones that had it, and they'd been adapted to a fighter jet, an, F-1, an F-100, and they'd found uh, a group of guys crazy enough to go over and, and use these aircraft and this modified equipment to hunt down the SAMs, and those guys were the wild weasels. So let's talk about these airmen involved in this. Maverick fighter pilots and electronic warfare officers volunteered, right, to fly. Right. This is This is like... Tell me what they're doing. They're like putting themselves out there as bait. <laughs> well, you know, fighter 
fighter guys are all crazy anyway, a little bit. You so think? That's no big deal. I was surprised that the electronic warfare officers volunteered as emphatically as they did because those guys came out of the bomber community. They'd never seen a fighter before. They'd never seen a fighter pilot. You know, they're two very, even though they're in the same Air Force, they're two very different types of people. You would think, but apparently not because they got along very well and they figured out, you know, how to, how to do this very well. And as for being bait, yeah, it's a common assessment of this, but, you know, I was a weasel too, and I'll tell you that we never thought of ourselves that way. We're the dangerous ones. We're the ones that are going out and doing the, the hunting and killing. You know, we're, we're not, we're not bait, and these guys didn't look at themselves like that either. They were the ones that, hence the name of the book, we're going to go out and do the hunting and the killing. That fascinates me. Let's talk about you wild weasel characters, and you are characters. You're not going to tell me you're not. I mean, really, supremely confident or egomaniacal? Talk no, to me. you know, and that's a common misconception. People, and I don't mean you. I just, I mean mostly <laughs> people mean that me. that envy that sort of person and mistake it for arrogance. And it's not. It's what it what it is is an awful lot of training, years and years of it, and then uh, supreme confidence that in fact you're better than anything you're going to face. Because if you don't think you are, then you don't have much of a chance at all of coming back. So you have you have to believe it. And you have to be able to back it up. But, I mean, you have to believe it. So it often gets mistaken for, you know, egomaniacal tendencies. But it's really not. Hey, so this training, and I think this is fascinating to me, they can do that. They can get you so on automatic pilot, almost to speak, that, and your response is so fast, so incredibly swift to whatever's coming at you. Is that what the training is? I always wondered about that. Well, uh, to some degree, uh, you know, what you're saying is quite correct, uh, today anyway. But I have to point out that when these guys were doing this, they were, they were the first ones. So they were basically making it up as they went along, and they didn't have the benefit like I did of 25 years worth of other people's, you know, fights and mistakes and lessons that they'd learned the hard way. I, I had all that by the time I went into combat the first time in the Gulf War. Uh, these guys didn't. So, again, they they were asked to do something. They weren't told what it was, and they were told they wouldn't have much of a chance of coming back, and they weren't given real great tools to do it, and they did it anyway. So, to me, that makes them very, very special. I, I don't remember if I asked you this last time you were on the show with your other book, but I want to ask you this now. Patriotism. Is that something that's ingrained in, ingrained in all of you guys who, who, who get involved in this because I don't think the whole of America has the same sense of patriotism um, that some do or that we all used to. Nationalism is kind of like, hmm, not like what it was. Talk to me about that. Is that Does that apply here? Well, it, you know, to some degree it, it does. Remember that, that anybody that, that flies, any, any military pilot is an officer, so they can't, they're not drafted, okay? And we don't have a draft anymore anyway. So they're all volunteers. Okay, and these are guys that have all been through college. They could all be doing something else, but yet they choose to do this. And, you know, you, we're, we're not alone. There are other professions that are equally loony that you, you kind of shake your head and say, why would they do that? Patriotism certainly has something to do with it. I think over time it gets tempered with, you know, a little bit of cynicism and experience, at least in my case. Uh, but these guys certainly believed in what they were doing. And, you know, not not to wave the flag too much, a lot of it is being able to face that sort of challenge and live through it. Because if and when you do that, you don't have anything else to prove to anybody the rest of your life. And that's kind of a nice place to be at, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, for sure. I'm going to sidebar because you brought it up, the draft. How do you feel about the fact that there isn't uh, a draft anymore? Uh, I, I personally, and uh -huh. I think most, most of the guys in Vietnam who who served alongside of draftees feel this way. You, you don't want somebody next to you who doesn't want to believe, be there or believe in it. So if you have to force people to fight, be it the draft or conscription, you know, what kind of soldier are you going to get? And, and there were some good ones, don't get me wrong, but I mean, I, combat is difficult enough without having to worry about the quality of the guy next to you. And, and, and I, I wouldn't want to do it. And again, I wouldn't have to because pilots are being officers aren't drafted so uh, that was never a factor for me All right interesting let's go back to the mission for a second um and the the the, the um rate of loss of pilot 
and capture was extraordinarily high back then, correct? Yeah, and remember, it's not just pilots in this case. The the guys in the back seat, right. the electronic warfare officers, the, this, the weasels, the original weasels could not have functioned uh, without them. By the time I came along, it was all single seat, but these guys had to work together uh, to make this happen. So they're, they're right in there with them. Um, things went bad, but then things turned around. It was great characters that you allude to and talk about in this book. Just fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Well, and they're all real, too. That's what makes right. it even better. I mean, right? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I wanted to meet each and every one of them and know each and when every one of them. I'm just fat. Captain Al um, Lamb and, and, and then, of course, Jack Donovan. <laughs> I mean, talk to us a little bit about these guys. Well, do they even make people like this, except for you, except for you, oh, Dan? Al Lamb is, is great. I, I was up at his house uh what a couple times when I was writing the book, and then I was back on the East Coast. Uh, I think in April or May, and 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 spent uh, spent a, a couple weeks out with him and his wife. And and he's he's a great guy, and he's you know he's he's indicative of that type of person. Uh, and, and they're still around today. The problem is the the people haven't changed. The Air Force has changed. The Air Force is a lot more politically correct and anal retentive than it ever was in those guys' days. So um, anyway, it's a different Air Force, but the, the basic basic guy that does this hasn't changed. Al Lamb, uh, Stan Goldstein, he's he's a hoot. He's one of the EWOs that really helped me out with this. Uh, Ed Rock, guy who started flying fighters, you know, around the Korean War and then ended up with a couple tours in Vietnam. Leo Thorsness, you know, he won the Medal of Honor uh, later on. These these guys are real. These guys are true heroes, and I, and that word gets you overused and used in the wrong cases a lot these days. But but that's another reason for reading this book is we don't really have a whole lot of true heroes these days, and sometimes it's good to look to the past a bit to to, to get inspired. So I hope people will. Well, I'm going to disagree with you. I think we do have some heroes today. You're one of them. And no, I would never say that. Well, I'm saying it for you, okay? No. And the thing is, I think that what happens is, I think we're so jaded today, we're not even clear what what a hero is. That's right. all. Well, it's not Caitlyn Jenner and her cat. So. Exactly. <laughs> you said that. <laughs> yeah. You said that. So listen, this is an important story for a lot of reasons, okay? I, and I love the fact that you went back and you, you, you told a story that hasn't really been told. And it's history. So it's important to an historical sense. Um, but let's bring it forward to today. You know, the Hunter Killer proves how resource, resourceful our Air Force can be. But how effective? So listen to where I'm going with this. It appears that President Obama seems to think that in fighting ISIL, ISIS, whatever acronym you're going to use these days, that um, he wants to call these lunatics, just that's what they are, so let him have him, his, his ISIL, ISIS, whatever, but that the Air Force can accomplish the job alone. Can the Air Force accomplish the job alone? No, and and the fact that he thinks so is is yet one more piece of proof that he is – the amateur that we've all seen, you know, come out. The, the fact that he's an amateur isn't unexpected. The fact that he has surrounded himself with other amateurs that won't tell him the truth. Well, that's kind of shameful. And the real, the real shame in all this, and it, it isn't just him. Clinton and even Bush did it too. They would risk our American fighting folks for political reasons, purely political reasons. And that's that's all he's been doing with air power is stalling. Uh, you cannot win a war from the air unless you drop a nuclear bomb on somebody. Uh, but but you can't win a war from the air. It's a it's a nice way to look busy, to look like you're doing stuff, and gives you a lot of good PR footage, you know, on the, on TV. But you can't win it from the air. You can lose a war if you don't control the air, but you can't win it solely from the air. So he's he's just biding time. Uh, I don't think he really knows what to do and. And in the meantime, you know, guys are risking their lives every day. So it's a shame. It is a shame. Let's let's go back to Vietnam in, in this sense, because uh, this is a question I, I would love to hear your uh, uh, expertise on. And I'm wondering if you believe that the agony of that defeat isn't still diminishing America's resolve and our commander in chief's in this particular commander's chief resolve. Do you think that still plays a part? Well, I don't think anybody who fought in it thinks we were defeated. I think that they... right. They, 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 and they're correct. They were not allowed to win, uh, which is, which is very true. Um, that was a war that did not have to be fought. I've never met anybody who fought in that war who thought that it had to happen. 
uh, which surprised me. Uh, but the more I learned about it, the more I realized they were correct. And there were several instances throughout the war when, when we could have extricated ourselves. And in fact, the other side was quite willing to do so. So I think Vietnam spelled the very first very big chasm between public belief and their leaders because, you know, obviously before that, especially in World War II, the, the whole country was at war. It wasn't just the military and the government. I think in Vietnam, the country was not at war. The, the political leaders and then by default the military uh, was at war, but not the people. And that started to cause a, a huge rift that we still see today because nobody really trusts the government anymore, do they? <laughs> no, I really don't think that they do. I mean, we, we make, there was a big mistake made when you, the guys came back from Vietnam by blaming, you know, the uh, warriors and not the commanders. Uh, and, and that's and the, something that I, I have seen over and over that I think has finally been healed. Yeah. People that were pretty big anti-war protesters you know, have has said to me that they they still don't they still don't believe in the war, but they went about it the wrong way. And I think most people realize if you want to protest the war, that's fine, but put the blame where it belongs, not with the people who have to fight it. Absolutely, I, I started this talking about the fact that um, Russia, quote unquote, was the bad guy. Russia still the bad guy, still a bad guy. Oh, absolutely, they always have been, and and they always will be. Uh, they, they, they are definitely worth watching because they have territorial uh, ambitions beyond their own borders. China, China may, but, but they're more concerned with the Pacific Rim and their own, their own ballpark. Russia, on the other hand, being Russia, would expand if they could. And, and they've always been a danger. So, yeah, you know, we, we, we need to stay vigilant. It's not to say we need to look for a fighter or get paranoid, but if we think the world's one big happy family ready for a group hug, we've still got a ways to go. I've been speaking with New York Times bestselling author, one of the most decorated and legendary pilots in Air Force history, Dan Hampton. His latest book, The Hunter Killers, by way of William Morrow. For more information on Dan Hampton and his work, visit his website at danhampton.org. Find him on Facebook at Dan Hampton author. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Helen Cancer Jane Show, a production of Resec LLC. Associate producer, Suzanne Probst. Music by Tony Rosales Jazz. Visit HellyCasserJane.com.